Hello, everybody. Welcome to the session. I'm Teresa Sequia, Academic Consultant for English Language Teaching here at Cambridge University Press in Brazil. Today's session is about the perks of being creative, and I'm going to start with a short unscramble activity. Because this is a recorded session, I won't be able to do the activity with you, but I'm going to show you how it works. I will give students a word and they have to unscramble it. In order to make it easier, I will give them a hint. All the hints are based on historic events, right? And in this case, the word is discovery. Another word and another hint. And the word is election. Another example with a hint. And the word is achievement. All this information was taken from a word power exercise from Interchange 5th edition level 3. I decreased the amount of uh, items because of time limit, but you can use all the words or even words from previous word power exercises for review, right? It's important to personalize to give students opportunity to use their background knowledge. As for variations, we can, in face-to-face -face classes, use real cards. So students can draw cards with definitions on them and come up with the right word. Or they can match words to definitions or examples. You can even play memory game or hangman. And uh, when students draw a card, if they come up with the right word, okay, if they come up with the uh, wrong word, then you start drawing the hangman, right? And the activity is finished when the man is sanged. It's a lot of fun. If you are online, then you can use Kahoot. You can prepare the quiz on Kahoot and uh, students will take it. And after they finish, they can prepare their own Kahoot quizzes, right? If you don't like Kahoot, no problem. You can use Google Docs where you can also uh, make quizzes or you can use a similar app. There are always uh, many different apps uh, to use for the same uh, purpose, right? Going back to the title of my presentation, Breathing Life into Your Classes, The Perks of Being Creative, uh, I would say that in my opinion, uh, when you talk about teaching, it's impossible to teach without being creative. These two things, they go together. And because there are so many things to talk about creativity, I will have to leave some, some things out. But I want to show you my view of uh, our teaching landscape and possible creativity constraints that we might have. Then I will use some um, sample activities uh, relating the activities to being creative, and that will lead us to some final considerations. Okay, so the session outs. Today, I'm not going to talk about creativity as one of the four C's. I'm not even talking about creativity as a skill that students have to develop. Um, I'm not also talking about creativity as a process and how does this process uh, takes place. I prefer to focus on the quality of being creative. And according to our Cambridge Advanced Learners Dictionary, creative stands for producing or using original and unusual ideas. But in, when it comes to teaching, in my opinion, it's not a matter of just creating things, creating ideas. You have to create valuable ideas, ideas that will help our students to achieve their goals. They have to add value to your classes. They have to be meaningful for our students because there's so many things happening in the classroom. Sometimes we have uh, different students with different age targets. We have uh, large classes, small classes, sometimes private classes. We have mixed ability groups who have to do with multiple intelligences, um, skills for the 21st century. There's so many things that will limit our, uh, let's say, range of action when we are creating a new activity because we have to think about time, we have to think about 
content about students' needs not to mention the way we are delivering the content, be it online, face-to-face, -face, or in hybrid classes. All this changes the way we think about the activities we want to develop, right? So I decided to spot important parts of uh, interchange exercises, and uh, because it's impossible to work with all of them, I select some of them. One of them is conversations, so let's see how we can be creative when working with conversations. This is a picture and I start talking to students by asking questions, by having them infer what is going to be presented by this picture. Little by little, they will see that it's snowing and there are people in front of the store. I can say, how many people were there? Oh, I can see one. Is this a man or a woman? Oh, it's a woman. What about the second person? Could it be a man? Wow, I think it's a woman. Wow, they're both women. Well, wow, one is freezing and the other one is okay. The freezing girl is called Ashley and Jessica is the other one. Who says this? My coat isn't very warm. I think it has to be Jessica, right? Uh, what about your scarf? Students have two. Try to guess. What about this one? I'm not wearing my boots. Oh, it has to be Ashley. This is obvious. But what about this one? Well, it depends on how you read it. It's snowing or it's snowing. What about the sentence? OK, let's get a taxi or OK, let's get a taxi. So you see, depending on, depending on the way students read it, they will try to guess who's saying the sentences. And once that's finished, uh, finished they will have at least 50 to 70% of the content of the text. And I'm not even talking about, about grammar. I am contextualizing the grammar and they are simply paying attention to the meaning of the words, to the meaning of the sentences and how they are being used, right? Grammar will come later. And the same thing happens here with this um, other example where Brian and Amar are talking. Brian is in New York where it's 2 p.m. and Amar is in uh, Australia where it's 2 a.m. Why are they talking? I mean, what they are talking about. One seems very happy and the other one seems kind of uh, sad or a little mad maybe. So I'll play the audio and students have to come up with general information. What are the characters talking about? Why is one so happy, right? After they listen to the audio, then I give them the text. Detail without punctuation and they have to read and punctuate according to what they understand from the listening and then from what's written here. You can play the audio once more, once they finish, they correct and you can play it once again, but they will only be able to check their mistakes when they refer back to the text. Then they will see what mistakes um, were made, right? And uh, through analysis, they will understand why these mistakes were made and were made and how to avoid them in the future. Basically, this is a learning training exercise, learning to learn that will lead them to autonomy later on, right? And I used exactly the same content. I didn't have to create anything, but the way I used the content was creative, right? So again, uh, conversations are followed by grammar exercises. And here is a grammar exercise with the grammar chart and exercises. Let's say students have finished. Then I can ask them to focus on the grammar chart in order to originate uh, new sentences, create new sentences. So I ask them to get their smartphones uh, and work in pairs so they can send a message, a hello via WhatsApp or a similar app that's common in your uh, country. Then they uh, write something they did yesterday. For example, I went to the movies. Then my partner is going to ask three questions. For example, 
uh, who did you go with? What movie did you see? How long did it last, right? And I will answer the questions, right? Later on, you can ask them to do the same thing for two other things. Something they ate last night and something they bought uh, this month. So other options is instead of using WhatsApp, you can ask students to use Google Docs, a PowerPoint, Excel, Word, whatever they uh, are more accustomed to using, right? And after that, they can use uh, also Padlet, which is th which I think is easier. For example, go to Padlet.com and build a board and write the question, what did you do uh, yesterday? And students will write sentences. Uh, later on, uh, students can read one another's uh, sentences and uh, ask questions. And then students can prepare answers and then they go back to Padlet and they post their answers, right? So later they can read all the information that is there and they can decide on talking about themselves or uh, talking about their partners using the information on the answers, right? They can even select what they want to talk about. Uh, let's say, uh, choosing interesting or curious things about their partners, right? What about being creative when planning your lessons? Come for food? Okay, I'll define that for my students and I will show them pictures and I will work a little bit with key vocabulary. For example, boil, uh, mix, melt, uh, bake, right? And then I'm going to ask them to place the pictures in order. Once they finish, I'm going to play the listening exercise and they will check if the order they chose uh, was correct. Then I can work on the reading passage and they will see the same uh, uh, recipe again. I will call one student at a time and ask this student to read the sentence. For example, uh, first boil the macaroni in a large pot for five minutes. And then you ask, this sentence refers to picture number and they will say four. Okay, and then you call another student and another one after that until all the sentences um, are used, right? And the pictures are uh, put into order, right? Once you finish, you go to the second uh, recipe. And in this case, you don't, don't worry about the order. Have students match sentences to the pictures. Of course, you're going to exploit the pictures. And the idea is to help them know what's happening in each of the pictures. Once they finish, then you have them work out the order. At this point, you can ask them to refer to the grammar chart, looking at the sequence adverbs and attaching the adverbs to the sequence, to the right sequence. Once that's finished and corrected, take out the words of the recipe and then have them retell the same recipe by looking at the adverbs. By this time, it's going to be the third time they are doing the same thing. So it's going to be not only faster, but it's going to be easier to them as well, right? So it's finished, right? But I want them to do something extra. So I am going to um, show different things they can make. Here, these things are common in Brazil. You can adapt to um, food that is common in your country or in your city, right? For example, brigadeiros uh, are made of chocolate and it's a very famous recipe here in Brazil and everybody knows how to make it. It's delicious. <laughs> so what I uh, want them to do is uh, get themselves into groups. Every group chooses one recipe and they uh, have to write the recipe into five different steps, right? They have to work out a way of doing so. They have to use their creativity and critical thinking skills, right? So I call these steps five steps to heaven, and these are the five steps, right? So they have to match the recipe to these uh, parts. 
Now, once they finish, what you can do is to have groups who work with the same recipe together so they can spot the differences. Or you can reorganize groups having uh, in one group people who work with different recipes so they can exchange information. Another thing that can be done if you have two, three students is to have each student working on a different recipe and then they get together and they discuss. If you have only one student, what you can do is to have them work out a different situation. For example, depending on their line of work, you can ask them to develop a new product. For example, a new uh, a new snack, a new car or new hamburger or anything like that, right? Uh, something that is important is to keep slow paced students uh, in mind. In mind, you can bring uh, recipes divided into slips of paper, five slips of paper, and they reorder the recipe and they insert the sequence adverbs later on. Now, for fast paced students, what you can do is to decide a type of food or recipe that they have to work on, for example, desserts. Then, groups will decide what kind of dessert they are going to work with. And after that, you can assign a given date for them to bring the recipe together with the dessert into the classroom. So uh, during the, uh, this activity, students will try every dessert in the classroom and they have to try to come up with the ingredients and the way the recipe was made, right? Finally, the groups will present their recipes and uh, the other students will check how close they got to guessing the ingredients and the way the dessert was made, right? I think it's going to be a lot of fun. This is the activity. This is the lesson, the whole lesson. Look how we think we changed things around. First, we worked with the pictures. Then we worked with the listening. Then we worked with the reading, right? Then we worked, uh, worked with the second uh, uh, recipe, but only with the uh, words, without the grammar. The grammar came uh, only afterwards, after the recipe was ready, right? And uh, as for the last activity, I totally changed that. How could I change, switch things around and create a new activity? Because I planned. You can only really create something new and valuable if you plan, because when you plan, you know exactly what's going to happen in that lesson. You know what your students will need and how you have to adapt uh, the content to their needs. Uh, reinforcing um, reading activities or listening activities or even speaking activities, right? So the key is preparation, right? We have to activate background knowledge in order to make the activity meaningful. We need to work on vocabulary to prepare students for the activity. We need to set the scene of the dialogue and we have to provide them with a clear goal so they know exactly what to do and why to do that. We have to surround students with follow-up and feedback whenever necessary and we uh, have to, uh, let's say, end up with a personalization exercise or consolidation exercise. So basically, we keep on saying that we need uh, pre-war and post activities for reading or listening. But for me, this is essential for every new topic that you present to your students. What about grouping students? Okay. So this is an exercise and students have to guess what they are doing. You can uh, guess the topic is present continuous. So what's uh, Daniel doing? Oh, he's sleeping right now. What about Leticia? What's she doing? Oh, she's getting up. What are L Leah and Eri doing? They are having breakfast. By this time, students have already guessed that um, we are working with daily routine, right? 
I'm going to do that very fast because I want to show you where the pictures are from, right? So they keep guessing, right? Have a couple of pictures and this is where the activity is from. Uh, interchange intro, right? Fifth edition. So after we do this, we ask students to read and listen at the same time. They do a little bit of shadow reading. Then you ask them to read out loud, to divide students into two groups, and one reads the question and one reads the answer. Then you have them to uh, you have them role play. You, you say something like, you're sad now. Now you're angry. Now you're in a hurry. Now you're happy. And every time they, re they answer the questions, accordingly in a different way right finally you ask students to read everything again again but paying attention to details because these uh, these details will be important for the next activity in this activity they will be working in pairs and they have to decide who's a and who's b right and they will be working with present continuous when they decide you ask b's close your close your eyes. When B's close their eyes, you give a set of questions to A's. So A students will read the questions and B's with their eyes closed. They will try to remember the information and try to answer, right? And only A's will have access to the picture. Now, the second time around, it's A's turn to close their eyes, and then B's will have a second set of questions they can make, they can ask, sorry. And in this case, A's will try to remember uh, the information uh, by memory, right? After this is finished, you see how we are building the content? They have to work individually. They have to come up with four more questions about the pictures using present continuous. They can look at their student books, print or ebook version as they wish, and they have to come up with original sentences, right? Later, you divide them into groups, either in the classroom or in breakout rooms, right? So together they have to check if they have all the answers for all the questions. Once they do that, they have to choose five to eight questions for a game and they have to be very strategic because they have to try to find questions that their opponents won't be able to answer, right? Then they get ready for the game. It's important to uh, walk from one breakout room to another or from one group to another in a classroom in order to provide support whenever necessary. Right? Then playing the game, you or the students can decide on the rules. So you can uh, score points or eliminate groups uh, after one or two um, wrong answers. And the groups can refer to the picture whenever they uh, have to check an answer to a question. Right? You can keep on taking and showing the picture again. So here we work with different patterns of interaction, whole class, pair work, individual work, group work, whole class, all this with constant recycling, monitoring, feedback whenever necessary, right? So it's important to provide the students with different patterns of interaction because they will work with the content in different ways, achieving different outcomes, right? being creative when working with skills. So what about giving them a topic, festivals? And they, uh, you exploit the picture, give them key vocabulary, and then every student, for example, A student will work with La Tomatina, and student B will work with Garlic Festival. They read the text for one, two minutes, and then they take out the text. If I want, I can work with four students instead of two, right? And then I put them together and they read what they rem uh, they retell what they remember about the text, right? If I want, I can in pairs have them change two or three details 
uh, in the text and their partners have to guess what's wrong, right? Then uh, they can change partners or groups and repeat the text, the task. Uh, something uh, important is that you can do that either online or face to face, right? And after students hear about the festivals, they go back to the book and they compare what they heard to what they're reading. And at this point, the reading is a lot easier because the content has already been worked with, right? Now, why would they read the text later on? Because there is a reading comprehension exercise. If they can answer without referring back to the text, no problem. But if they can remember, they will be forced to look for the information, right? This is how we make mean, uh, reading meaningful for them. So expanding the topic a little bit more. Students can work in pairs or group and search the web for two or three other fe festivities or festivals. And uh, uh, they use the text in the book as a model to produce uh, a short paragraph on the festivities or festivals they are working with, right? And for slow paced students, you can pre select uh, vocabulary, um, you can pre select uh, texts and upload them divided into uh, groups to OneDrive or Google Docs. And you can share then the link of the or the QR code, and students will access in order to have content that is, uh, let's say, more appropriate to their level of English. This is something that you can do, right? And you can ask them to uh, prepare themselves to talk about the festivals they have worked with, right? And this is the whole reading part. Now, listening and reading, you can work with different ta uh, tasks. pre warm post different focus, grammar, vocabulary, only looking at this, see how many um, source for creativity we have here. Not to mention that we can ask the students to look for more detail on the topic, and that's called narrow reading. We read different texts on the same topic, or if we're talking about uh, short stories or poems, we can ask the students to look for different uh, options or different examples. We enhance exposure, but then again, they can either create their own or you can do the same thing. Uh, choose uh, some texts, some poems and short stories and upload them and share the link with them so they have more appropriate content, right? Edward de Bono is the author of a book called Six Thinking Hats. He is a psychologist, physician, and author. And he said, there's no doubt that creativity is the most important human resource of all. Without creativity, there will be no progress and we would be forever repeating the same patterns. That would be terrible, wouldn't it? So the perks of being creative, when we are creative, we favor variety, and by variety favors different intelligence spaces, styles of learning. We uh, save time, especially when we use activity right off the page. We uh, learn how to take risks. We improve our ability to handle the unexpected. We improve our ability to improvise we make the content more uh, relevant to our students and we adapt the content to what they need to develop. So flexibility and higher focus, not to mention motivation because we're always bringing new ideas and energy to the classrooms and to the lessons, of course, right? All activities were taken from the Interchange 5th edition series, right? Well, I want to finish the session with a quote from Neil Gaiman, the author of Sandman and Coraline. And it kind of justifies why I think it's so important to be creative when you're teaching. Here he says, the world always seems brighter when you've just made something that wasn't there before. 
Isn't it true? Whenever you create something out of the book and it works out so well, kinds of lights up your classes. And this is something so important. It's important not only for us as teachers, but also for our students. Well, I guess this is it for the session. I really want to thank you very much for your participation and I'm leaving my email address in case you want to contact me, right? I believe that later in the week we're going to have a live session where you can ask uh, questions if you want to, right? I hope to see you there. Thank you very much indeed. Bye bye.